Hello and welcome to episode 16 of The Habitus. My name is Bobby Lowe. Uh, follow us on Twitter at HabitusPod. Uh, subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, TuneIn, and YouTube. Um, some sad news to start the show off this week. Um, after a string of poorly received film choices, uh, Michael has been let go from the podcast. No, I'm joking, of course. I'm here with Michael Patterson, who has stubbornly chosen yet another of his favorite films for me to watch for the first time. I'm what done. have you got for me this week? I can't, I can't wait for you to tear it to shreds as normal. Um, <laughs> I've got, first of all, Touche Pas au Grisby, uh, Jacques Becker's, um 1954 classic French crime film. And then I have our first animated film, 1985's The Adventures of Mark Twain, uh, directed by Will Vinton. And yeah, and that is then, our first animated film. I, yeah, it's our I first animated film. Yeah. Um, and then I've got to follow up with that um, breakdown, the 1997 um, abduction thriller starring Kurt Russell uh, by Jonathan uh, Mostow. And then finally, we've got um, Musaranyas or Shrew's Nest, the 2014 uh, psychological horror directed by. Uh, first-time directors Juan Fer Andres and Esteban Roel. Um, so, are you ready to to get into these? Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm with trepidation though, because as has <laughs> already been established by this point, every film I recommend for you to watch, you hate. So, you know, please like this one. Let's go straight into it. Touche par au Grisby. Qu'est-ce qu'il veut cet Angelo? Ah, parce que t'as pas d'idée là-dessus. T'as pas d'idée sur ce qu'il voulait faire quand il est venu t'inviter à sortir à 2h du mat' pour une affaire bison. Bah ben, essaie de gamberger un peu pour une fois. Je vois pas, Max. Ben, moi je vais t'expliquer. Il voulait tout simplement t'emmener dans un coin tranquille et puis te travailler à la caresse pour savoir où on avait planqué notre grisby. Et puis pour être plus sûr, il voulait m'en bailler moi aussi. Alors tu y es maintenant, hein Je vais m'occuper d'Angelo. Tiens, non, bonne pomme, tu vas aller leur passer lui et sa clique. Et alors c'est à moi que ça revient, il me semble. Eh ben, tu vas bien nous foutre la paix, hein, t'entends Cette affaire-là, c'était ma dernière affaire à moi. On la faisait, puis on était tranquille. Il y a longtemps que je l'attendais, tu sais. Il y a longtemps que j'en ai marre de toutes nos petites conneries et de tout notre cirque. Je veux prendre ma retraite, moi, tu comprends pas, non C'est bien, Max. Tiens, tiens. Tiens, mais regarde ta tronche un peu. Regarde, gaffe un peu les valoches que t'as sous les yeux, regarde les miennes, et puis ça, et ça. Crois que c'est beau, hein Eh non, mon pote, crois-moi, va pour accrocher, allons. Ok, so, Touché par au Grisby uh, translates from French to Don't Touch the Loot, uh, though it was released in the US as merely Grisby, uh, or Loot, and in the UK as Honor Among Thieves uh, in 1954, directed by Jacques Becker and produced by Robert Dorfman, written with Becker by Maurice Grief and Albert Simonin, uh, adapted from Simonin's novel of the same name. Uh, the film's a French-Italian co-production that charts three days in the life of Max, played by Jean Gabin, a career criminal who at the start of the film dines at the high-end Madame Bouche's uh, a cafe or restaurant with um, his pal and associate Riton, played by René Derry, uh, having just, uh, we surmise, stolen eight bars of gold in a heist. Uh, later that evening, Max and Riton take their respective girlfriends, Lola, played by Dora Doll, and Josie, played by Jeanne Moreau, to uh, a nightclub where Max catches Riton having an affair with fellow... No, he catches uh, Josie, sorry, not Riton, catches Josie <laughs> having an affair with uh, fellow gangster Angelo, played by Lino Ventura, um, when later that night, Max is followed home by two of Angelo's underlings. He escapes what he supposes is some kind of attempt on his life um, and figures that Riton has spilled the beans regarding their bullion heist to Josie, who in turn has told Angelo. Uh, sure enough, Angelo is after Max and Riton's gold and manages to take Riton hostage to interrogate him as to the whereabouts of the gold. Max, meanwhile, proceeds with his own plan, finally proposing to Angelo that he will trade his gold um, for Riton. That's that takes us into the some way into the film. Um, I got mm -hmm. a question for you, right? Yeah. Do you think Max plans simply to trade the gold for Riton at the end of the film? Yeah. 
when he meets with them. Uh, so that you know that takes us into you know spoiler warning everyone if you haven't uh-huh. seen this film, but it takes us into the sort of the final sort of trade off. Now to me, Max, he doesn't really have like a backup plan in order to sort of get back or retain the gold and get Riton back. He seems to have resigned himself to merely just giving the gold away to Angelo. Yeah. Yeah. Or giving is, it to them, and then maybe he has some sort of, uh, you know, maybe that's not the end of the plan. Maybe he has a plan for, once he gets Riton back, maybe he has a plan for getting the gold back after. Yeah. Uh, but we don't get any insight into that because it all goes so wrong. Yeah, it is. Uh, um, and the film operates on a need-to-know basis, and so if he does have a plan, we never get to know it. Mm-hmm. Um, quite a slow slowish start of this film. I remember it being yeah. a lot more action-packed than it is. Um, I mean, it builds to a sort of very explosive climax, uh, literally yeah. otherwise. But, um, you know, the first sort of 40, 50 minutes are kind of... Uh, I mean, not quite real-time, but it's it's mm-hmm. a slow start. I'm, 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 I feel like I'm talking a lot here to defer the inevitable... <laughs> Uh, savage treatment it's going to receive from you. Uh, no, I really, really like this. I really oh, enjoyed it. Oh, God. Hooray, hurrah. <laughs> Summer has arrived. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, and it wasn't what I expected at all, actually. Uh, it would, would you agree that it's it feels very, like, if you, if you set aside, like, your knowledge that the film was produced in the early to mid-50s, mm. it, it, it kind of, its sensibility feels... Like it comes from a later time. It feels uh, like it's in pursuit of a kind of noir archetype that would require a certain level of self-awareness on the part of the filmmaker. It feels like the sensibility is something that comes from somebody who has already digested all of noir and they're trying to kind of like pare it down to elemental components, mm. Uh, mm. like archetypes. Um, it feels like there's a deconstructionist kind of undercurrent to it. Uh, that I, I was really surprised by because it's 1954. It's right in the thick of the, you know, original uh, yeah. noir period. It's not even neo noir, let alone post noir. Yeah, no, I, um, I understand what you mean. Yeah, I um, I know Jean Gabin primarily through uh, Pepe Le Moco, 19, like which was very much a, a kind of a prototype for what became known as noir, French or American, right? Um, mm. And at this point of his career as an actor, I mean, I, he wasn't the first choice for this role. And um, I think he's kind of perfect in it, and I think he lends it a certain weariness that I think um, contributes to or or informs what you've just referred to, like this kind of not postmodern, but like a very sort of mature modernism uh, or kind of a, a sophisticated almost acknowledgement of the ingredients of what yeah. we now know to be this genre. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it takes its time in a very sort of because, because it, it it's like 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 you said, it, it has this kind of very kind of it, it's I would it, it doesn't even feel like a slow burn. It feels like um like the like the film is aware of the kind of expectations that you would have coming into a film with that title in that genre, uh, and instead it's going to give you these kind of these kind of like wry humorous moments with this character who himself is an is a kind of a, a kind of a f- humorous variation on a on a familiar archetype as well of like mm. the kind of the season the seasoned gangster but like yeah. the scene where he he and he and um what's his name Riton, isn't it yeah Riton, yeah uh he he and Riton are are they realize that they're you know they're in danger their lives are in danger that somebody yeah. is after their their gold and they uh max takes Riton to this other apartment that he has that he yeah like he a safe he, house he, yeah it's, it's basically a safe house yeah uh but he doesn't use the, that language either it, it, this is just like another apartment for him and he says you know but i don't spend a lot of time here as though it's like a holiday home or something yeah uh, but yeah it is that's what, exactly what it is is a safe house but it, does, it doesn't have that kind of uh melodramatic kind of um uh you know it's not in that register it's like it's it's it's, it's, there's something really, really funny about. It. I was trying to put my finger on what I found well, so funny about the like. Just the fact that these are two like two middle aged male yeah. gangsters in a in a fifties noir, yeah, brushing their teeth together in their pajamas and you yeah. know that kind of thing. And like, 
and then he gets into bed turn like in his pajamas gets into bed turns off the light and lights a cigarette <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? and it feels very kind of self-aware and very wry yeah um he's gonna sleep on the couch as really, well right that's true yeah and then Riton says no 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 like you know i'm, I'm your guest but let, let me sleep on the couch and he's like yeah all right <laughs> yeah um, and, and and also the scene before that before they go to bed when they first arrive there mm. and uh, uh max is is max is based like and again this is like it's a scene that you are familiar with from a hundred crime movies mm. uh where the you know the like the gangster has been betrayed or suspects that their 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 friend has betrayed them or whatever yeah. um or you know co- somehow compromised their safety or their their position and they're sort of trying to feel them out mm. um but this one is like done over is it pate they're eating on crackers yeah or is it cheese i couldn't make it out in black and white but it was whatever they're eating like some some yeah. they're putting the, and he's like you'll have to make do with crackers <laughs> like it's just it has this really peculiar tone and it's, it's like every 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 detail, every moment of it feels uh, idi- idios, like very purposefully idiosyncratic, mm. um, and designed to kind of undercut expectations. Um, yeah, I get it. I mean, like it it unfolds with the kind of, and I say this in a in a hopefully endearing way, or, or in a way that's meant to find the film endearing rather than as a criticism. But it unfolds with a kind of clunky elegance for me. Um, for yeah. instance, like, um, you know, these these kind of older guys having to arrange rendezvous across the city, uh, the whole, like, the first 25 minutes just seems to be them on the phone, like, saying addresses and times in which to meet. And on the one hand, that creates a real urgency to their situation. But then on the other hand, like, Becker shows us the journey across the city rather than just cutting from one flat to the next. He actually, like, the, they spend a lot of time in cars with a uh, back projection behind, um, which obviously watching it from a today's vantage point uh, sort of emphasizes, you know, we're aware, we're made to feel aware of the time passing. So like, it just seems to be a lot mm. of dead time uh, rather than like just cutting through straight to the action. So I love the way it sort of establishes the relationships between these characters because as the film comes reaches its conclusion, there's there's kind of some stakes there. Like, you know, he has this dilemma. Does he allow Angelo to just, like, you know, kill Riton in order for Max so then Max can just, like, you know, run away with the gold or retain it or whatever? Um, yeah. But he doesn't because he's a man of principle in the end. Um, or, or so we were led to believe. And that moment of crisis of conscience is also the only moment where we get narration. Yeah, yeah not, it's weird. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's the only it's the only moment where we get that, which again feels like, oh, you expect narration in your in your noirs. Mm. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, like this is this is a year. This is released a year before Rafifi, uh, the Jules uh, Dassin film. Uh, I'm which... not that familiar with with the French with the French noir. So Rafifi's like no. Have you seen mm. Rafifi? I haven't seen. It's, I know it, but I haven't seen it. So it's it's noted for its very lengthy, elaborate, almost silent, purely cinematic heist scene. Um, mm. And this film, again, to sort of uh, underscore what you're saying with regard to it, like feeling like it comes after all of that. This film is like a, entirely a post heist film. I mean, in the in the you know, as I said in my synopsis, yeah, yeah. we surmise that the heist that he's, you know, got the gold bars and whatever else uh, because we see yeah. it on the front of a newspaper in the first scene. And it's about mm-hmm. what unfolds in the three days after that. Um, and it's <laughs> it's it's a weirdly tense film. And yet, until the final sort of 20 minutes or so, we never really feel like there's a ticking clock suspense yeah. to it, if you know what I mean. I don't know if I found it tense. I, I, I found it predominantly funny and surprising and uh charming and cool mm, yeah yeah you know um and yeah bizarrely modern one of those films that just feels like it was incredibly out of its time uh, gaban's great in it isn't he yeah he's he's so great yeah I, I love i love the it's established early on like it might even be the opening scene which is well, maybe it's no, it's not. Sorry, it's it's after they go out with the with their their girlfriends, uh, and 
he's basically just saying that he just wants to go home and go to bed. And he's just, <laughs> he's just exhausted and all he wants is to go home and go to bed. And it's like, and I, it, it doesn't, the film doesn't quite play that up as it goes on, you know, but I, I kind of, I was, uh, very amused by the idea that that was going to be like a running theme throughout the whole movie that everything that was going to happen was just going to be this thing that was basically just standing in the way of him getting a good night's sleep um <laughs> yeah but you know he even he reminded me of larry david actually in that scene in curb your enthusiasm where do you remember he and jeff are talking in one episode about how larry finds sex uh boring or something like that. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know he just doesn't want to get over with because <laughs> um, he says something like that doesn't he say uh They'll want, they'll want to go out for onion soup and then we'll have yeah, to go yeah. home and get it on. <laughs> <laughs> onion soup, yeah. Such a, yeah. such a great little detail. It's very funny. The dialogue's great. Yeah, every, all the details in it are just great. Um, like, even that, even the it's detail also much... of um, Vuitton check, check, like checking his saggy face in the mirror in the, in the yeah, same yeah, yeah. scene where they're <laughs> I was going to say that, yeah. in their pajamas. Because he's, he's, he, at, at the scene where they're eating the pate or the cheese or whatever it is, uh, uh, Max says to Riton, he's talking about how this score uh, was supposed to be their retirement score and that, you know, they're getting too old to do, you know, what they have done for their whole lives. And he, he reaches over and he, he uh, what does he, he, he touches, oh, he, yeah, he talks about the bags under their eyes and also the, the waddle on their chin. Yeah. And that, so that prompts, that prompts uh, Riton when he's left alone in the bathroom to examine his face. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like he's never noticed it before. It's really good. Um, it's also, uh, like I said, I'm not that familiar with uh, with French noir. I haven't seen, um, I certainly haven't seen many of them, uh, particularly from this period. Like I've seen some of, I've seen like you know, Le Samurai and uh, Le Cercle Rouge and things like that, but they're mm. like quite a bit later. Um, but it's it's much bodier than than like U.S. noir, you know. Uh, yeah. Which would have still been under the Hayes Code and yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, no, there's a sensuousness know. to the. To the image yeah. here, yeah. Um, also, the smoking, um, like the the copy that I watched was was very high definition, and it's like there was a scene where I can't remember. It was late in late in the movie um, when he goes back to the club, and he. Uh, oh no, no, sorry, no. It's in the apartment when he's in. T- he's, it's in. Uh, is it Jos- Josie? Yeah, Jean Moreau's Josie's apartment, right? Yeah, yeah, Josie. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he goes, he goes to interrogate her. It's this, it's the hilarious scene where he's slapping everybody. He just slaps everyone. He, he slaps everyone. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> he just gives everybody a slap. Uh, it's great, but uh, he's just like standing there and he's smoking, and it just, he, it looks like he's, he's just standing in like a, a cloud, like a plume of smoke. It looks like he's about to burst into flames, like he's about to spontaneously combust, or like he's a contestant uh, on uh, stars in their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, it's also, and the plot is the the plot's pretty simple as well, isn't it? Like yeah, you synopsized I mean, it yeah. quite quickly there. It's not. Yeah. It's not. It's not like densely plotted, um, in a kind of Chandler esque way. It's yeah. uh, straightforward. Yeah, and therefore more appealing to me. Yeah, yeah, I get you. And uh, Lino Ventura uh, plays a great uh, villain, I think, in Angelo. Mm. Um, really tough yeah. guy. I knew him primarily. Uh, well, the first film I watched with him in was Army of Shadows. The Melville film, oh, yeah. uh, which he plays a very diff- different kind of character, but he has this, he has this uh, presence. And actually, weirdly, from you know, I, I watched this film first, and the only time I'd seen it was maybe three or four years ago now, and I'd forgotten that Ventura was the villain. I thought he was Gaban's pal, so I thought he played the Viton character rather than Angelo. And uh, it's great to see like a younger antagonist against Gaban somehow. Um, younger mm. yeah um yeah yeah like 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 a like a kind of the somebody in the position that max probably was in 20 years previously very much so yeah now, now max gonna, yeah. now max wants out yeah uh, and he has to deal with you know uh, yeah these up-and-comers who are more are hungrier and more ruthless than he is maybe yeah and more Although resourceful not necessarily more well. ruthless like like more res- maybe more resource well would you say that well angela's connected to, to say. the other guy isn't he who runs the club but Max feels very canny. Like he doesn't feel like he's easily taken advantage of. He feels like he he's been mm. around the block, you know, and he knows he knows he, he's kind of like two steps ahead of everybody. Yeah, uh, he knows exactly. Like because because this is a, like a younger version of himself. Like this is he knows what he would have done at that age if he was trying to do this. And yeah, you know, it it, it doesn't he doesn't feel outmatched. Um, 
It's true, and and there's a certain quiet confidence with which he goes about his business. Like, so I mentioned, the film operates on a need to know basis. So there's a scene later on when like Max is like sort of putting his plans together for the final trade off when he's going to swap the gold bars for Eton, and they're arranging the rendezvous. And Max is on the phone to Angelo sorting the deal, and we cut to others getting um, Ramon back, uh, Ram- like getting the hostage that they've taken, Angelo's guy, Ramon. Mm. And then we cut back to Max, and he's already on the phone to his uncle Oscar. Um, so we don't really know what he's actually sorted out with uh, Angelo. And we only join him with Oscar, like, halfway through that conversation. So we go into that final scene, like, not really knowing the plan, which I think lends the whole thing a certain tension. And mm-hmm. I'm, you know, obviously, obviously, again, spoilers, but, like, in that final scene, this is why I asked at the very start here, do you think he intends just to, he's resigned himself to thinking, you know what, sod it, I'm just going to trade the gold and it's not worth it, let's get my pal Riton back and forget about it, maybe think about getting the gold at a later point, I don't know, but obviously Angelo's mm-hmm. plan is to trade off and then they have a second car to kill Max off, to yeah, kill them all to off kill anyway, them, yeah. yeah. Um, and he doesn't, he doesn't know about that. He doesn't, doesn't know about, about that, no. Um, so yeah, it's, I don't think we have evidence enough either way to say whether he p- plans to just give up the gold. Yeah, I would. I would guess based on the character, no. Yeah, that he has a plan for getting it back. Um, but that's the sort and, of... and not 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 a vague plan like oh we'll think of something later. But yeah. like I think he, there's probably a second stage to the plan where he, yeah. he knows what he's going to do. Yeah. Um, um, I've just had a horrible thought that it's really obvious from the film what that plan is, but neither you nor I <laughs> picked up on it, uh, as is often the case. <laughs> but um, no, but what I what I meant to say is like it lends the the film uh, the climax a real sort of bittersweet um, poetry because in in thwarting the threat of the second car, they then are able to go after Angelo. They blow up his car. And mm-hmm. they're able to then retrieve the gold and get away with it. But obviously the car's on fire. There's another like um like a, another car coming coming along the roads, like so they're gonna be witnesses and he's just like, Oh, mm-hmm. forget it, you know, like so they never so they have like a, a sec like a an un um an unanticipated second chance to actually get out of it per, in a perfect in as perfect way as you know, could be could have been conceived. Yeah. But then they don't, and he has to sort of uh, retire, basically, and be seen in the final scene, and the film kind of comes full circle again, but he doesn't have the gold, uh, which yeah. I like. So on the one hand, he gets away, because... And, and again, I didn't really remember how the film ended. So I'm glad he got away, but obviously he doesn't get the get the gold. Hmm. So what's so what's this for you, like a an eight? Yeah, it's an eight, yeah. Oh, good, good man. Oh wow! I need yeah. to start recommending more. This is giving me confidence again. I've got my confidence back for recommending films. What was this? This wasn't on your top one hundred, though, was it? Um, I'm, well, no, because I don't think so. I have to say it wasn't because there was only one foreign language movie on my top hundred the last time, <laughs> <laughs> which was ridiculous. Which I was getting like death what, threats what was for. The, what, it, well, what it was, was the, it was actually like film? a dialogue-free essay film, but like there's, there's certain, like toponymy, the Jonathan Perel Argentinian film. Oh, that doesn't count. That doesn't yeah, it count. doesn't count. There was no, there was no <laughs> foreign language narrative films on my last top hundred. I don't think so, anyway. Unless um, maybe there was some Bellator in there. Anyway, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't on there. Um, but uh, the other, the, the only other film, because Jacques Becker, uh most sort of famous film, I think, is Casque d'Or. Uh, which I believe to be a, a period romance, uh, which is very high on my to see list. But the only other films of his I've seen is Le Trou, which he made um, a few years after this one, which is a prison escape drama come thriller, which is really great. On Letterboxd, that's actually his uh, most popular one. Is it his most popular? Most right. Yeah. No, it's great. It's got a real, like, rugged, like, um, sort of. Again, like nuts and boltsy, and feels like mm-hmm. in terms of prison escape dramas, it feels like it's come after rather than come before, like the classic yeah. uh, examples of its genre. But I highly recommend. When it. When is that from? Is that before this? No, that's nineteen sixty. Okay. Yeah. So it's after a man escape then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah this is an this is near for me as well. Okay. So will we move on. Yes, please. To. Something completely different. 
The Adventures of Mark Twain, also known as Comet Quest. I'm tired and old. I wish I were with my living. That's really why you want to meet the comet, isn't it? And I am looking forward to that. But, Mr. Twain, we're too young to die. Die? Fiddlesticks, you're not gonna die. But how are we gonna get home? As soon as I get to that comet, this vessel's all yours. This ship! You mean it? Oh, boy! Oh, no. The power! Dad, blame it! What's going on? We have smashed the power panel! What? We didn't know. We're trapped in here. If we can't get to the emergency power switch, the airbag will blow us all to hell! Oh, no! Okay, so The Adventures of Mark Twain, released in the UK as uh, Comet Quest, um, directed and produced by Will Vinton uh, for Will Vinton Productions, uh, written by Susan Shadburn and based on various different works of Mark Twain. Released in 1985, distributed by Clubhouse Pictures, and um, was not a box office success. It had a budget of $1.5 million, and its domestic gross was eight hundred less than $850,000. Uh, and it's, it's kind of, despite being really groundbreaking and despite being uh, the first feature-length claymation film, uh, mm. it's kind of fallen into the status of a cult classic. It's not that famous. Mm. Um, so the story it's also it's kind of I don't know I was kind of going back and forth on this whether I would classify this as an animation anthology or not it's kind of halfway there uh, so it's it, it has a story but the story takes up kind of half the running time and then the rest is made up of short effectively short films um, on, on different subjects yeah uh, we'll come to that in a second but yeah okay. so the framing narrative that takes up kind of half of the running time is about um, is about Mark Twain elderly Mark Twain um, who has built himself a flying ship uh, and he plans to go and meet Halley's Comet. Uh, Mark Twain was born the year that Halley's Comet passed Earth and he died the year that Halley's Comet passed the next time, uh, 75 yeah. years later. Um, and he, this is his, he views this as kind of like his fate. He says it will be like one of the great disappointments of his life if he doesn't uh, go out with the comet that he came in with. Um, and stowing away on his ship are uh, Tom Sawyer, Hook Finn, and Becky Thatcher, uh, three kids obviously from his most famous uh, stories. Um, that's about it for the for the. Uh, there's also a shadowy figure who also seems to have stowed away on the ship, whose identity is revealed later in the film. But as far as the story goes, that's kind of about it. Mm. Um, had you had you seen you hadn't seen this before, but had you heard of it before? I hadn't heard of it before. Um, I'm ashamed to say. I'm even more ashamed to say that I've never read anything by Mark Twain. Neither have I. Okay. And watching it watching it this time, uh, I and obviously doing a little bit of research on it, I I wondered how much because I really really like this movie, but yeah, I wondered how much more I would like it if I understood the literary references. Yeah. And right. then the, then I was then I was thinking of like. You know how, or maybe, maybe that's partly to blame, or to maybe like the the underperformance and you know lapse into obscurity of, that the film uh, underwent could partly be attributed to that quality. Yeah. That it's kind of very high concept. It's very, uh, very literary, very esoteric, um, very meta in a way, and mm-hmm. and and right from the right from the opening crawl, even you know, uh, like. <laughs> It's it's pretty obscure. Like it's pretty kind of. I I, I know that that uh, Mark Twain is not regarded necessarily as kind of like he's not like James Joyce or something like that. It's not like something you only read in university or whatever. The whole idea is that Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn are like the, the these are like the great American novels and like yeah they're supposed to capture a certain kind of uh, 
you know, idealized youthful experience, youthful adventure or whatever. They're kind of templates for those, for movies like Stand By Me and things like that later on. Mm. Uh, but, but I still, I don't know how widely read there maybe 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 in america it's different but but yeah here, i think they I have a i think they have a cultural value to americans that perhaps you and mm. i don't aren't able quite to grasp uh it's weird that this film is actually titled the adventures of mark twain as well um when the adventures Except in the uk where it was comet quest yeah which is a terrible because, title, which is, by the way. it's 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 not yeah but it's but you can understand like the adventures of mark twain sounds boring uh, yeah, I mean, there's, 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 an, exciting. there's the Irving Rapper 1944 film called The Adventures of Mark Twain, which is about Mark Twain, uh, starring Frederick March as uh, Mark Twain. Um, but uh, what I was going to say is that, like, in relation to that film, I mean, that film is very much a bio- biopic um, or a biographical account of him from birth to death. This, like, I mean, he's in it. But it's like the adventures or the adventures that he wrote. I mean, we get, you mm. know, we get like uh, uh, his version of Adam and Eve, um, yeah. which is kind of like a bizarre episode. So like, come back, come back to the, to your synopsis there when you were like, you know, half of the film is like a framing device and then half of it's like kind of like an anthology film. Because I think you're right. Yeah. Um, so, so the idea... <sighs> It's kind of it's kind of a strange structure because okay so the the film has this kind of um it's kind of a, a strange fusion as part of the reason that I like it as well because I I actually really like the the southern gothic mm. as a as a as a milieu and as an aesthetic mm-hmm. uh and obviously I don't I don't I don't think quite think Twain is classified I think he's kind of like a precursor to that in the 20th century but mm. uh Certainly, Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn and so on—they're you know forerunners of the Southern Gothic, uh, you know, literary tradition and cinematic mm-hmm. tradition as well. Like mov- movies like uh, you know, um, like like David Gordon Green's early films, like like uh, George Washington and, and Undertow and things like mm-hmm. that. Um, but uh, fused with that is a steampunk thing, where it's like you know retro future. He has a steam-powered flying ship with all sorts of science fiction technology incorporated into it, mm-hmm. and it has this. There's a, like there's one of the sequences deals with uh, heaven for other species, for like you know a human ends up in the heaven of another alien species, and there's a whole a lot of yeah. science fiction elements woven into the yeah. period setting. Uh, so it's quite unique in that respect. Um, so you have this science fiction element. And they have on the ship, they have a device, an elevator that brings them to different stories written by Mark Twain. Yeah. And there's one sequence where, and this is the, this was the moment where I thought like, how esoteric is this? Like there's a, there's a moment where the three kids are in the elevator and they, they accidentally go to Injun Joe. Right. Yeah. And, uh, like I said, I've never I've never read any of these stories. Mm. Uh, what I know of Mark Twain, what I know of, uh, or rather, sorry, what I know of Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, I know through cultural osmosis, you know, through parody and reference in other in other texts, mm-hmm. you know, mo- movies and and cartoons and things. Um, but I, so I I recognize the name Injun Joe, but I do not under I do not like understand the reference, and I would have to assume that like kids watching it wouldn't either. Yeah, um, yeah. So he, so they stop. The elevator stops, and the door opens, and this like terrifying, like serial killer kind of character like leers out the door with a knife, mm. and they very quickly shut the door. And 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 uh, Tom, I can't remember if it's Tom or Hook says, uh, "Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to meet that guy again. Uh, he was scary. Like remember last time? It's like okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's a strange one, but the thing is, it seems to me that the natural thing to do would be to use that elevator as the structuring device that connects all of the segments, yeah. but they don't. I mean, you could imagine they, they have a bunch of different ways of, of, of uh, leading us into these different little yeah. uh, short films. Like there's one where they have a, some sort of, some sort of telescope thing that that's the one where they see the, the, uh, the one in the guy in heaven. Mm. And then there's the one with the, there's like a computerized map thing. And that's how they get into the story about the frog. Okay, so let's go through the the, the stories. Like there are five. <clears throat> sorry, no, there are four. There are four different stories. 
Uh, the first one is is Tom Smiley, which is about a frog who's like the fastest frog to ever live or whatever. And mm. and uh, apparently this is the first story that Mark Twain wrote or either the first one he wrote or the first one he had published. Uh, and he comments on that in the film as well. He says that he, you know, he, he was sure he could do better than that or whatever. Yeah. So Yeah, it's a celebrated um, jumping frog of Calaveras County is the, is the short yeah. story that he wrote. Yeah, and the we go into that. That that's about five minutes long, mm. and then we get the Adam and Eve segment. Yeah, okay. And this is like this is the complaint that I have of the movie. The Adam and Eve segment is way too long. It's yeah. so long. Yeah, of course it is. And it's like yeah. okay, so we go into it for fourteen minutes. Mm-hmm. Okay, then we come out of it. Then we have another segment that I'll talk about in a second. Then we have the heaven segment. Yeah. And then finally, we come back to the Adam and Eve yeah, segment like because the kids say, you never zero. told us. <laughs> yeah. You never told us the end of the story. Yeah. And we go in for a further nine minutes mm. of it. Of 23 of, minutes of, way, of an 83 minute yeah, film. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, we spend in this other really very, very thinly related story. Like it's, mm. it's technically, it's like an allegory. It's, it's about his relationship with his, uh, his late wife. Yeah. We find that out at the end that that's oh that's kind of obvious I suppose when you think about it but the yeah I, mean, I, I don't particularly yeah. care for the for the Adam and Eve story I just fi- uh, I also find it's the it's the weakest sort of visual visually conceived it's also uh, yeah. Episode. yeah like if if it's like it starts strongly with the creation rendered, sequence fair enough yeah. you know then it justifies its length but it's weird because you've got on the one hand you've just said the slim running time of eighty three minutes this unevenly like inherently uneven episodic structure right so by its very nature mm. some episodes are going to draw us in more than others right you can actually you yeah. can actually see this conceived more as a non-running sort of television series because it, it doesn't it doesn't have length on its side i mean I, I love the i love the brevity of the film i like short features right um it works to its advantage it but in order it, like it doesn't really maximize its own brevity if you know what i mean like it wastes a lot of time in as you said like the adam and eve segments um, sure like i mean but the, the thing is so you've got the tom smiley one you've got the other one that we'll talk about in a second yeah and you've got the heaven one yeah. and they're all five minutes yeah. each and the adam adam and eve one is 23 minutes so it could be four <laughs> sure it could be four stories yeah you know adam and eve could be five minutes and then we'd have three other ones and yeah. the more you have uh, the more natural that structure feels. Yeah, I get it. It feels get it feels it. Yeah. less like it feels less like we need to make some sort of connection between these, and it feels more like okay, a kind of a rambling uh, journey through the works of Mark Twain. I get Whereas it. Whereas this is a very limited selection of the works of Mark Twain. Uh, obviously, a lot of the elements from his work are incorporated into the framing narrative because the characters are in there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but okay, so let's talk about the other segment that I haven't named yet. Mm. Okay. So this is the mysterious stranger, which is quite comfortably by a distance, my favorite animated scene or sequence of all time. Okay. Uh, I think it is unbelievably beautiful, uh, like technically stunning, um, disturbing and profound and haunting. Yeah. It's it's terrifying. Just like deep, deeply weird. Yeah. Deeply, deeply weird. And so, so like, (laughs) <laughs> okay, so let's describe it very briefly. Again, they get they get there through the elevator. Mm. Um, they meet this uh, strange figure with a kind of a masquerade um, mask that changes its, its expression into very malevolent kind of expressions. Yeah. Uh, who claims that he is Satan? First, he claims that he's an angel, and then they ask him his name, and they say that his name is Satan. And yeah. They say, "Oh, that's a strange name for for an angel." Um, they come into his, and he's living on this little floating kind of planetoid. Um, where he demonstrates his powers, he gives them their favorite fruit, which sp- sp- like spontaneously appears in their hands, and they're eating the fruit. And then he makes people and he makes animals, little uh, simple sort of clay figures that come. He he sculpts them and then he gives them life. But then they go about their their daily life, and that just the sound of them mm. infuriates him so much that he decides to inflict disaster on them. He causes an earthquake. And then eventually he ends up he ends up killing them. And we get this sequence of people like being being crushed and like f- screaming and fall and like mourning their dead and they're like people transforming into coffins and the earth opening up and swallowing people alive. Yeah. And uh, 
it all sorts sort of starts to run out of control to the point where the kids actually get scared and they they leave him alone on the on the little floating rock in space and uh he just starts monologuing yeah. about the the worthlessness of human life and he he talks about uh you know uh all of your um i can't remember i wish i could remember the exact the phrasing uh but it's basically like this <laughs> like extreme uh like disturbing nihilism mm. um i thought when he you know when he starts to um when he he squashes like three or four figures and when he removes his hand the mound of you know well clay that he's caused by it then transforms as you suggested there into coffins there's a there's mm. a beautiful what I, what i like about it is okay it's terrifying like the imagery the fact that the his like mask is also he's not wearing a mask he's, his head is a mask but without eyes yeah. Um, and as you said, it changes into this malevolent sort of expression. But um, there's a duality. It also to changes it. into Twain's face. Yeah, that's right. There's a duality yeah. to it um, because the mysterious stranger is voiced by two different people at once. So this has a beautiful timbre. Uh, Michelle Mariana and Wilbur Vincent are the voices. Um, and the timbre, the voice, it's like this weird, otherworldly, non-human mm. uh, texture, um, which. You know, it doesn't really, before you even begin to think about what he's actually saying, there's just a really weird, lovely um, dimension to it or character. Yeah. So, and after he after he wipes out the the village, mm. like kills all the people, uh, Hook objects. He says, "You murdered them," and the mysterious stranger, uh, the the face turns into a skull, and he says, "Never mind them. People are of no value." We could make more sometime if we need them. And his final uh, monologue to himself alone on, on his, his floating rock in space is, life itself is only a vision, a dream. Nothing exists save empty space and you, and you are but a thought. And at that moment, his face, we get, we get this slow zoom out as it fades to black, and his face is uh, in the pupil of Mark Twain's eye. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's really, like... And again, that was a moment where I thought, I wish that I had, I wish that I like understood the kind of the the history, the biographical detail behind sure. the mysterious stranger story, which apparently apparently he never finished. Right. Um. So, you know, and and then there's there's the whole thing with like the the basic fact that this is a, a suicide mission mm. for Twain. Mm. You know. Mm-hmm. Like when you think about this as a kids movie it's incredibly dark and actually the when you look up when you look up the mysterious stranger segment on YouTube a lot of the uploads uh state that it was banned it was never banned but it it has been cut from TV broadcasts of the movie <laughs> on like the Disney channel right. and things like that yeah, you know yeah. because it's just like you know yeah. it's not for kids it's not that that particularly that moment is just not suitable for kids it's really disturbing mm. uh and uh it's like about Satan murdering people. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's, I mean, you know, I, I was actually when I was watching, I was thinking, oh my god, we're back to Avengers: Infinity War here. Yeah, you know, it's like the Thanos character. <laughs> um, this, the, the, what do you, what do you make of the? Um, I mean, if if we may move on from that episode, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. what do you make of the the one with the the guy going into heaven? Uh, it's okay. Yeah. I mean, because it right. follows the mysterious stranger, um, yeah, yeah. perhaps, you know, because it's not as good, it's therefore bad, but it's not that case at all. That's mm-hmm. not the case at all. Um, yeah. I, I like the certain details of it, like heaven is a place of 24-hour pizza, beer, and dancing on the sign outside, uh, which is quite funny. Um, and the, the sort of mm, astute, like, poignant quality of the scene as well. So, like, when the guys push to tell the three-headed alien um the like the gatekeeper for this for this version of heaven wherever he's from he says like well san francisco or california and <laughs> i'm from the world yeah. and yes but which one and he's the like world, the yeah. world it's like you know it, it it's a kind of becomes a comment on like human myopia and mm. you know like how there's so much more out there um that we can't quite fathom and grasp and understand and that's fine, but like the the process of coming to terms with that, um, is kind of a painful one. But also, the 
the destination of that journey is quite like a, a you know a peaceful one, I suppose. Um, yeah, yeah. No, it's good. It's just I, I kind of feel that if uh, you know the Adam and Eve segment was one quarter yeah. the length that it is, and you could you could therefore fit in four or five other yeah uh, short segments that every single one like you know assuming that let's say let's say that they were all. Uh, kind of around the same quality as the yeah. uh, as the heaven segment. Yeah, that would that would help the heaven segment. You know, if you know what I mean. Yeah, like it yeah, would yeah, give, it would give a greater variety and a, and a sense of. Uh, I always feel that way with with like actual anthology films, where you know when you have a film where it's like eighty minutes long and it's four twenty minute shorts, yeah. that feels like they should all sort of click together in a particular way. Whereas if you, when you get something like. Uh, you know, like the Khan movie to each his own cinema, yeah. where it was like 33 three minute films, yeah. or like the AB- ABCs of death, where it's like 26 four minute films. They're so short that, you know, you, you go, ah, oh, this one, this one didn't really yeah, work. It accommodates, but before you know it, you're on to the next one. It yeah. accommodates an unevenness, which is actually more forgivable rather than it being yeah. like Because it's inherent, it's inherent yeah. to the form. Yeah, I agree. So, like, if, if it's inherent to the form, you may as well embrace it because you can't avoid it. And you embrace it by having a lot of segments. Mm hmm. Yeah, you know. I get it. Um, uh, but I, overall, I like the tone of the film. I think, um, you know, because because the strong elements are so strong, um, and I completely mm-hmm. agree with you that, you know, the Adam and Eve, especially the first one, is just far too long. Um, but, like, this, this, by the end of the film, like, there's a real sort of sadness that's crept in. Um, and, yeah. again, arguably, you know, thematically, this just isn't a children's film anyway. Um, yeah. Like because the also the, you know the doppelganger who yeah, we see on the ship, yeah. so the stowaway the, that you the mentioned, dark, in the, the dark side, yeah, yeah that who is who's the when they get by the, oh, sorry by the way the the storm sequence mm. is just stunning like it's the animation is so amazing yeah with like uh, the inflatable hands as is the, as is the, the sequence where they meet the yeah as is the sequence where they meet the comet like it's just so kinetic and, and vibrant yeah. uh, I love I I love claymation. It's probably my favorite form of animation. Stop, well, not necessarily just claymation, but stop motion animation is my favorite uh, type of I animation. Never, I've never been pushed to think of my favorite kind of animation, but um, and my sort of I don't know uh, hesitance going into one is informed heavily by how many well borderline bad ones I've watched. Um, but it, when it's done right, it's it's beautiful. And this film, the texture of it, the detail. I mean, just from the get go with like that pool table, and when the book opens and like the universe kind of explodes or like flows yeah. out of it, like waves become trees, become mm-hmm. other things. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, like the the wrinkly expressivity to the faces and the hair and the textures, and uh, which kind of yeah. complements beautifully, I think, like the peculiar vernacular of the vocal deliveries and everything else. Um, like, whatever whatever one makes of the Twain characters' epigrammatic lines, um, I think James mm-hmm. Whitmore's verbal performance is, is great. Like, yeah. it really sort of delivers its the strange, charming, cynical wisdom of them. Um the the doppelganger yeah, sorry, yeah, who good, eventually good, reveals yeah. himself to be the dark side of Twain's personality mm-hmm. uh, during the storm, uh, one of the kids witnesses him on the deck, uh, like con- like conjuring the storm, mm-hmm. conducting the weather, mm-hmm. you know, uh, which is also so dark. And the uh, at the end when he reveals himself, it's like, um, it's like it's it's like a metaphor for depression. It's like his like this is like a suicide mission. Uh, and this is like his, you know, like this is his dark side. This mm. is like his, you know, his self-destructive side. Mm. Uh, it's really. I, I just, I just wonder how much more I would like this if I understood, if I, if I knew more about Twain's life, mm-hmm. and if I had read the, ma- the major texts that this refers to and draws from. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, don't I mean, know. like, it, it, um, I mean, it, it. You mentioned like the dark side, and yet inevitably, it's a side that can't be you know suppressed or in any way or, or it has to in some way be um accepted because mm. it has its own creative qualities yeah. um you know um even if they are or might be understood to be self-destructive they are uh, equally him if you know what i mean 
Um, and like, although when I say that, it, when I say that it's self-destructive, he's actually the, that's actually the side of his personality that's more reluctant to meet the comet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I love the final sort of. So I mentioned like the the, the sad or poignant tone at the end. Like, on the one hand, the film points to this sort of cosmic indifference, you know, with the guy entering heaven and being, like, pushed to explain where he's from and he can't really see beyond that human horizon. Um, but then on the other hand, like, this... Even when it's... even When the film gets to its darkest slate on, you know, Tw- Twain himself says, you know, against the assault of laughter, nothing stands a chance. Like, the idea that laughter is, mm. is humanity's greatest weapon... And it's the only thing that sort of anchors human experience in a way in the face of this said um, cosmic indifference, um, which for me are very sort of fundamental, obvious things, but the film, you know, explores them in a very um, brief and very profound way um, Mm -hmm. at at points. And yet I didn't love the film. Right. I, I do love it. I, uh, yeah, I do. I do love it overall. Um, mm-hmm. My only real complaint with it is I wish the Adam and Eve segment was shorter and was replaced with uh, other, yeah, you know, like, yeah. Um, I I actually didn't realize until recently that um, Will Vinton. I've I've seen a lot of Vinton's. Like he, he Will Vinton is um, he's responsible for the California Raisins and uh, the Noid, which are both like. Again, yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> You're shaking your head at me, yeah, but I don't know. The thing, thing is, I don't. I, I only know them by hearing them referenced in like songs and like TV shows, like The Simpsons and Family Guy and things right, like that. Right. Uh, they're from ad campaigns in America, right. uh, so they're really, really well known. They're like these cultural uh, touchstones. Um, so they did that in the late '90s. And they also, he also made loads of like really good short films. He also made an, a short adaptation of The Little Prince, the French novella. Um, but in the late nineties, they were probably because of like the rise of like, you know, the fact that stop motion animation is just nowhere near as popular as it once yeah. was, uh, even though it was never dominant or anything like that, but you know, C- C- <laughs> like even the fact that Ardman animation had a deal with DreamWorks where DreamWorks made CGI yeah. films like flushed away yeah. using the Ardman aesthetic, yeah. uh, but in the late nineties, they needed investors and Nike invested in them wow and travis travis knight uh the son of the ceo of nike started working at will vinton productions eventually became like the ceo of it i think and then they rebranded themselves as leica right who are the production company f- responsible for carline paranorman the box trolls and most recently kubo and the two strings right, right. i didn't realize that, that i didn't realize the connection i didn't realize that leica yeah. is will vinton productions Oh, you didn't know that? It's well known. It's well known. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 complete news to me. No, I, I only um, found that out. I only found that out recently. Uh, yeah, um, but I, I, the, the, I have a funny relationship with this film because uh, I didn't actually see it until I was about twenty-five. Right. Uh, but I have a really intensely nostalgic relationship with it because um, when I was four or five years old, um, I used to rent the same videos over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Uh, and the three that I remember I used to rent over and over and over again were GoBots, Battle of the Rock Lords, uh, Star Chaser, The Legend of Orin, and uh, The Adventures of the American Rabbit. And one of them had the trailer for this at the beginning. Ah, right. So I saw the trailer so many times. Right, right. And I, I did a bit of research, and I think it was most likely The American Rabbit that had it because... Uh, I think GoBots was distributed by Clubhouse Pictures, who produced this, or produced and distributed this, but they Clubhouse Pictures produced and distributed The Adventures of the American Rabbit, and I think that's probably something that was more tonally in line with right. this. Not that that was as dark as this, but I think that's more likely. Uh, so both both the Clubhouse Pictures uh, company imprint at the beginning of this film and the film itself, the, particularly you, the moment that you mentioned with the... Uh, the book opening and all like yeah, the yeah. nature flowing out of it and everything like that was in the trailer uh so it was yeah, it's, it's weird to have a really intensely nostalgic relationship with a film that you saw for the first time when you were 25 for you know um, remind me the, the the age you were when the, you, those three films were rented over and over and over again i don't know five maybe all right because for a moment there i thought you were 25 when you were renting those films 
<laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that, but um, <clears throat> yeah, I was a bit. Oh, I was they're a good confused. films. Um, have you seen the Little Prince, the 1979 film? Mm, yeah, it's good. Is it because I, I I know the novella, but I I haven't seen yeah, the yeah. film and wasn't aware. To be honest, as I say, ashamed to say that you know I didn't know this film. I didn't know Will Vinton's work, um, and mm. I should definitely definitely check that out then. Yeah, it's only half an hour. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. So, what, what would you give this out of time? Um, this is a seven. A seven? Yeah. Yeah. Seven. Which means? Which means? Okay. So, in my ever flowing, fluctuating um, <laughs> ontology, fortnightly ratings, updates, um, seven at the mo- at the time of recording, seven means really like six. Whereas means, for me, seven means, means like. like. Sorry. Uh-huh. Seven Whereas for, for me, se- seven means like. Okay, so this is now an eight for you, I'm guessing. It's then. an eight for me, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. But that means that we like it equally. <laughs> yes, yes, that's the thing. So I need to add <laughs> another integer because I... Remind me what six is for you? It's uh, I like it, but I have qualifications or reservations about saying that. Ah, you see, I don't have that. So I, I need to add that. So maybe it is... You need, you need a qualified thumbs up. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. Yeah. See, like five. Oh, no, no, no. Anyway, now let's not get into that. Let's move on. Five, we move five, on? five is the, five is the liminal space. Okay, let's move on uh, <laughs> let's to, move on uh, to, 19, to breakdown. 97's uh, breakdown. What do you want? Huh. It's not what I want. It's what you want. How bad do you want it? Because it is going to cost you. Can't show it to you right now. But it's about five, five, 115 pounds, three or four of that just pure tit. Nice curly brown hair upstairs and down. Interested? Why? What is why why us? <laughs> Bring him up here. Town of Bracket, Jeff. Two bit shithole in the middle of nowhere. See the bank down there? few minutes you're going to walk in tell the manager you want an express wire in the amount of ninety thousand dollars from your bank account in boston cash how do i know she's still alive come on jeff need you to pay attention now you see that building with the flagpole coming out the top of it yeah that's the sheriff's station. There's exactly two cops in this town. One of them's pulling desk duty right now. The other one's on patrol in the foothills. About a minute ago, Billy here called in an accident on the I-40 connector. See? There he goes. It's going to take about 20 minutes for that cracker to get out to the connector. Another 10 minutes to see there's no accident. Another 20 minutes to get back in. That's 50 minutes. That is exactly the amount of time you have to get me my money. Now, before you get any half-baked ideas about calling in the cavalry, just remember we're going to be watching you every step of the way, and we're going to be listening on those scanners. And if we see anything unusual, an unmarked car, a plane, one human being who even smells like a cop, well, you can just keep your fucking money, Jeff. And I'll send you pieces of her from time to time. Okay, so Breakdown, directed by Jonathan Mostow, uh, screenplay by him with Sam Montgomery, produced by Dino De Laurentiis Company and Spelling Films, and distributed by Paramount Pictures. Uh, it was made for $36 million and released in 1997 to an eventual box office take of just more than um, $50 million. It concerns Jeff and Amy, played by Kurt Russell and Kathleen Quinlan, uh, who are driving their new Jeep from Boston, Massachusetts to San Diego uh, through Arizona when they narrowly avoid colliding with a truck. Stopping shortly after at a gas station, uh, Jeff is confronted by the truck's driver who mocks and derides Jeff as a wealthy out-of-towner. Um, soon after that gas stop, Jeff and Amy's Jeep, uh, surprise, surprise, uh, breaks down. Oh no. Uh, when the truck driver from the gas stop uh, appears to drive by them, only to stop somewhere ahead on the otherwise empty road, uh, menacingly. Jeff and Amy uh, begin to fear the worst, but they're saved by the appearance of a semi-trailer truck behind them, whose friendly driver, uh, Warren Red Bar, played by J.T. Walsh, 
offers them a ride to the next diner somewhere down the road. Uh, reluctant to leave his new Jeep on the road, uh, Jeff decides to wait while Amy takes the lift and promises to return with some help. As the hours pass, however, um, Jeff grows concerned and then discovers that his Jeep's battery wires had been disconnected, possibly manually, possibly not. Uh, Bobby, I don't know anything about cars, so you'll have to tell me if I've fluffed the meaning of this scene up. Um, I'm sure you know more. That's what I gleaned from it anyway. <laughs> uh, anyway, Jeff, Jeff drives to the uh, next diner on the road, can't find Amy, is brushed off by its owner, and so on. Uh, then he sees the semi-trailer truck again, the one in which Amy took the lift, and follows it only for the driver, the same driver as before, to deny any previous encounter, even in the presence of a passing cop. Uh, and then, as things proceed, it turns out that Amy has indeed been kidnapped and is being held um, so that Jeff can transfer some money in the scene that we just heard. Wait, do you, did you take that driver to be the same driver as picked her up the first time? Come on, what? Have I fucked the <laughs> synopsis again? What? No, I'm only joking. <laughs> oh, God, thank heavens, jeez. Um, yeah, if, if, if you're not getting that in joke go back and listen to our um f our conversation about the history of violence a few episodes back uh, <laughs> a conversation which revolves around my fundamental misreading of the synopsis of the film um anyway i'd seen this film before on channel four um i remember it, i don't know if it was the network premiere um but i remember it being advertised it was on a saturday night screening um and my family and I watched it. I remember it it, it looking very very good, uh, mm. and I think I had either either I had just watched Spielberg's Jewel, or my parents were making the connection to Jewel and recommending that film to me also. Um, and it's been a film I've been wanting to revisit for ages. I know you'd seen it before. You're you're a fan of this film. Yeah, I'm um, very fond of it. Uh, and I, I a similar first experience with it as well. I saw it uh, when it was first released on home video and it would have been my parents who rented it. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is my parents kind of film. You know, this is yeah, th this kind of like, uh, th like suspense thriller with a, a domestic angle. Yeah, um, I get it. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm very, I'm really fond of that subgenre as well, which is something that hasn't, I don't know if it, like it still it still exists, but it doesn't exist on this kind of scale well, anymore. It doesn't exist with well, this kind of gonna, caliber yeah. of actor. It doesn't exist with I this kind gonna, of budget. I, um, I was going to ask you, like, opening question: Is it fair to say that films don't films like this don't really seem to be made anymore? You know, they they like they yeah they are they are made, but they seem to be like you find them straight to net. They they go straight to Netflix or mm. something like they're not this they they don't occupy the same cultural space that they did in the eighties and nineties. Uh, mm -hmm. when they were really, really popular, like a movie like, uh, you know, The Hand That Rocks the Cradle or Fatal Attraction or whatever. These were like big films that everybody talked about. Hand That Rocks the Cradle, in. another favorite of my parents. Yeah, mine too, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and Fatal Attraction yeah. and, and things like that. And that, what's that one with Ray Liotta? Uh, Unlawful Entry. Unlawful um, Entry, yeah. Yeah. And and, and, the, and Scorsese's Cape Fear as well. Um, those yeah, kind Pacific of Heights. No, I've never seen that one. With Michael Keaton. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, so the yeah, obviously, obviously, Jewel is is a is a reference point, but so is the Vanishing, um, Spur, Spurlus, uh, yeah, which I haven't the, seen. Is it is that Danish or Norwegian? Scandinavian, anyway. Like, I'm not sure which country it's from. Uh, which was remade? I haven't seen the remake. Have you seen the remake? Let's keep no, I haven't someone. seen either. No, no. no, no. Uh, do you, do you know the way that film ends? No. Okay, I won't tell you, but. Uh, I thought you had seen that, and a lot, of, <laughs> a lot, a lot of what I have here to talk about <laughs> compares really? right down to the managing. But uh, oh, never no, mind. Sorry, no, no, uh, no, it's okay. It uh, okay, I just need to <laughs> try to uh, ad hoc remove uh, any reference to the vanishing. Or, um, well, I like I like films. I'm naturally disposed towards films about missing persons or people who go missing in the course of the film. Mm -hmm. um, like for me, this is like Jewel meets Frantic, Polanski's uh, thriller. 
in sure. which That's... Harrison Ford plays. A, I'll a, replace a, all my vanishing team. references in here with frantic references. Okay, sure, great. Um, you know, plays a plays a guy whose wife goes missing while he's in the shower um, in their hotel room, I believe, if I remember if I remember that film correctly. Um, I have I like this film and I like it a lot. It's one of those though that. I want to continue liking it as much as I love the first sort of 30 minutes. And yeah. it gets to a point where it begins to, it begins to become too neat. And I remember feeling the same with Frantic when I, and I can't recall Frantic in a way, um, cause it's been so long since I saw it, but I remember thinking, ah, this is going down a path that I didn't want it to go down. Like, so sure. doesn't know, the Frantic, scene Frantic just... becomes political, doesn't it? Doesn't yeah. Yeah. A political it... thing. Yeah. Yeah, but like again, like so you know the scene that we've just heard. Um, that's the point at which the film begins to get a little bit disappointing to me. Okay, like so the scene where <laughs> the scene where you've just played a joke on me about when wait, wait do you think it's the same guy? You know, so when uh, when Kurt Russell you know sees again J T Walsh and he's like. <laughs> What the hell's happening? You know, you just, I just saw your wife, you know, you were with my wife half an hour ago and he's like, I'm sorry, pal. Like, I don't know who you are. Yeah. That for me is like, oof, creepy, eerie, horrible. Yeah, his, his line um, delivery is very good there where he says, he, 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 there's like a pause and he says, what are you doing? You yeah. Know, like like this doing? kind of moment of complete disbelief. Yeah. Like, yeah. What, like, what, what was a kind of a normal situation? Because he, he, he thinks that he's wearing shades when he stops the car and he, he thinks that the guy just doesn't recognize him. Sure. And he's yeah. like, you know, this, what do you mean? This was half an hour ago. Uh, and then he realizes that there's something sinister going on. Um, yeah. But then, like, so it gets to a point where, obviously, that atmosphere has to bottom out in a way because it needs to advance into the thriller that it becomes. Yeah. And then it becomes a slightly different film in tone and texture and purpose and feel. Um Right. Because it because it turns out that he has taken his wife hostage. Now, bear in mind that <laughs> they don't have a mechanism for Kurt Russell to get like to find them. Do you know what I mean? Like they're just relying on him coming upon them again. Because if if they're if they're it doesn't really make sense to me because if their intention all along is to get money off these people, then why don't they just contact him and say, Yeah, mate, like we've got your wife. Well, that wasn't their intention, though. Their intention was to kidnap both of them. Oh, so I have misread but, the plot. <laughs> yeah, well, they they say that you know when yeah, yeah, toward the end yeah. of toward the end of the film when uh, what's Kurt Russell's character's name? Jeff. I don't like I don't like referring Jeff. to characters in films as Jeff. Yeah, that's Jeff. what you know. I historically I have confused uh, Kurt Russell and Jeff Bridges. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know but, exactly what you mean. But, yeah. but Kurt Russell, but only in like I would never confuse, uh, I would never confuse Kurt Russell with Jeff Bridges in like Escape from New York or something like that. Yeah. It's only when Kurt Russell plays an everyman that yeah, I start yeah. to confuse him yeah. with Jeff Bridges. So the fact that he's called Jeff in this, and the fact that this has, uh, you know, when we talked about Starman, we talked about like the iconography of the American yeah. Road movie, the motels, and everything. I think these two films yeah. don't help that. Um, well, that I, I felt the confusion. same with um, Kurt Russell's young version in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two. Oh and yeah, like, yeah, me, that, me too. Yeah, it's yeah. like Tron as well, where that also uses the same technology with Jeff That's Bridges. True, yeah. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> maybe they're the same person. I and I, and also in uh, in Executive Decision as well, where uh huh. Kurt Russell play like Kurt Russell doesn't play the tough guy. That's Steven Seagal plays the tough guy. Yeah, and Kurt Russell plays the kind of the nebbish kind of scientist guy. <laughs> I always yeah. think, yeah, Jeff Bridges was in Executive Decision. Uh, he's but, so good in this, Kurt Russell. He's, he's so great. Good. Yeah, Kurt Russell's actually one of my favorite actors. He's actually one yeah. of my favorite. He's, he's very very reliable and like, I don't know, like would you? I, I don't. I don't know if I quite call him a character actor. I think he's he's. No, he's more of a leading man type, isn't he? Yeah. Really, but. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Like, I, I just, I guess, I like the fact that he spent so much time in genre films. Mm. You know, he never really did the types of films that Jeff Bridges did do. You know, yeah. a, a lot of kind of Oscar-y kind of movies. He never really did that. So he's in a lot of movies that kind of appeal to me more. Mm. Uh, still mixing up though. And he's um, a Republican, which obviously goes down well in your. Oh, of course. Your book. I didn't actually know that, but thank you for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, no, but you're 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 right. I am the. And this is where I have to tiptoe around the vanishing now. 
um, the film the film shows its hand surprisingly early mm. because it is set up as though this is going to be a long kind of grueling uh, you know emotional odyssey for this character that's going to you know you know <laughs> just that redaction sentence about the yeah. about the vanishing um yeah. but so the the <laughs> the uh the I mean, revelation I obviously, I obviously now know what happens in the vanishing because <laughs> of this uh, twisted torturous way that you're trying to circumvent it so i can't believe you haven't seen the vanishing <laughs> <laughs> let's just end this segment right here <laughs> um so okay, what what I want to what I'm trying to say here is uh, this is nowhere near as dark a film as The Vanishing, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Th- this is this is not about these guys. I don't know if they would technically meet the the, the definition criteria for for serial killers. I don't think mm. they do, but like they have mm. killed people in the past or whatever. But they're they're motivated purely by like mercenary considerations, sure, uh, yeah. and they are. So I agree with you that like about 30 minutes in when the scene that we just heard plays yeah. and we, it, everything is demystified at that moment. There's no more mystery it's, after it, that. Yeah the, yeah, the disappearance reveals itself to be a conspiracy and it loses its initial power for me. And it conspiracy? Begins, and, Would you call it a conspiracy? Well, like, like what I mean is that I guess the better way to phrase it is just demystifies, as you said. Yeah, so uh-huh. conspiracy, as in like they have conspired to. Oh, okay, sorry. So because I actually, I, I was going to say that in. Sorry. They have conspired to disappear her, or you know, like sure. kidnap her, or yeah, take her from okay. the film. But the first thirty minutes of the film, where yeah. it plays like frantic, or it, play, it plays in this kind of Hitchcockian uh, mystery kind of vein. Yeah. Um, they do gesture at a possible conspiracy where we're kind of led to suspect that the guy, not only the guy working, the guy who owns the diner, mm. but Bell's diner, yeah, uh, who who you know uh, uh, Jeff tries to get to Jeff Bridges tries to help to get a uh, to help <laughs> tries to tries yeah. to get him to help him, and he's kind of yeah. like he's not really he doesn't really have time for this kind of you know he just I don't know, but you're yeah. also led to believe that the the patrons maybe. You know, they're they're almost a little bit suspicious. Yeah, because uh, all the reaction shots are from his sort of perspective. Uh, yeah, his kind uh, of Jeff's... paranoid perspective. Yeah, and then he goes out and he, he's trying to make a call, and this uh, guy who appears to have uh, some kind of intellectual disability is mm. like washing a car, and mm. he, as it turns out, he's actually one of the kidnappers. Yeah, uh, and he's just putting on this performance. But he says something about the police are the ones who were in on it, and it's mm. like it's going to be this really far-reaching uh, conspiracy that involves political people, and I'm like, what's going on? Mm. And but then yeah. the revelation is that it is as banal as it could possibly be. Uh, it's a, it's not even it's not even like it's not even lurid in a in a serial killer kind of like oh isn't that isn't that so like twisted and disgusting and horrible and incomprehensible? It's like this cold rational mercenary thing where people are just kidnapping like their their plan was to kidnap both of them and then you know get them to transfer the money and then kill them and bury them in the desert yeah you know that's the, yeah. when he's in the barn toward the end he's overhearing them talking about how that's right yeah you know we should have we should have got both of them and he's like well, what do you want to like what do you want me to do he wouldn't get in the truck uh so that was that was their plan and I guess their contingency plan is to send that guy in and pretend to be this local guy who's willing to give him some yeah. information. And I don't know. Yeah, yeah I don't know how, how they deliverance. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how they get. But but as uh, as, a, as a sort of as it begins to progress beyond that point, then you know once it loses its initial mystery and darkness and becomes something else, um, it begins to sort of spark my incredulity at the expense of emotional involvement so like all of the you know car chases and action sequences towards the end i mean there's that there's that sort of semi-tense one where he's um jeff is on the underside of the semi-trailer mm. truck yeah that's good and he's trying to get uh, he's up, trying to get yeah. safety behind the yeah cab <laughs> it's the yeah. cab isn't it yeah that's good um, 
But uh, yeah, like he's the, trying to get there without without him glancing in the mirror to yeah. seeing him. Yeah, that's that is that's good. Well but like done, the yeah. later the car chases, like particularly when once they get to like the final sort of ranch, I'm going to call it, uh, like the barn, etc. <sighs> like I. Yeah, like it has, it has like I, out, I never, outright action movie beats yeah, in the yeah, I, part I, about I, like he dri- driving the truck through the building and yeah, yeah. the the, the no, other I, truck flipping upside down and blow, exploding and all sorts. Like I remember even when a, I saw that. Yeah, it never reaches a point where like I dislike it. It just it, yeah, I agree. it just becomes a very different film to what I want it to be, um, and it doesn't quite sustain the kind of tension that it's that it establishes extremely well early on. Like, this is mm-hmm. a Fulham, like, it's such a stripped-down film. It's 93 minutes. It has... Nothing seems to happen unless it's going to advance the plot, especially early on. Like, it, it just feels like... I mean, the, I, I suppose that... I was trying to think of, like, a real mainstream equivalent, and maybe it's the kinds of films that Liam Neeson's making at the moment with... Um, what's his name? Uh, Hama Kalitsera. Yeah. Um... Yeah, yeah, they're they're more high concept though. Yeah, most of them. Well, maybe not like Run All Night or something like that, but yeah, uh, I know what you mean. Um, I I don't know. I this this time I remember feeling exactly that way when I first saw the film, and I've seen the film quite a few times mm. uh, over the years because it did seem to be on Sky Movies and stuff like a lot, and it's very mm. watchable. It's very compulsively watchable. Yeah, kind of no matter what time, no, no, no matter at what point you turn it on, you kind of just end up watching it to the end, um, which is you know. A, pretty ringing endorsement as well uh the revelation half an hour in of what exactly is going on and the complete dissipation of any mystery element from the story uh yes it kind of it feels a little bit kind of deflationary Mm -hmm. um but i i do kind of turn around on it a little bit later when we get to the farmhouse and all that and it's just there's something really kind of pathetic about these guys um yeah and something kind of I, I like the scene where where jeff goes into the house and holds them at gunpoint and the kid comes in with the rifle yeah, yeah. uh and he <laughs> the and but I, I what i love most about that scene is that the kid is like really upset and like he's doing what he's been kind of coached to do and like he's supposed to be the man of the house but he's like eight years old and uh jeff is trying to convince him not to to shoot and it's it ultimately is the mother who says shoot him Mm -hmm. she screams like shoot him uh and yeah i know i really i really like that scene that's really good Um, i like the scene just before it as well when uh they they're not aware that he's in the barn mm. um and uh he's like in the rafters up above on the ceiling and uh, his wife sees him and yeah. I don't know how I don't know how she sees him, but she does. He's looking. He's looking through a hole in the yeah, the exactly. Boards, but and like she's how, on her back, yeah, and she. But like, how does she, she see his eye and then like realize it's him? I mean, it's completely silly, but um, <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. But uh, I, I think that's a great scene because it's also the scene in which you know, uh, Red Warren is uh, giving all the expository villainous spiel mm-hmm. in terms of what they were going to do. And he's so, I mean, we heard it in the extract there, but he's so great at delivering those, like, fucking horrible lines, you know, yeah, like, yeah. you know, cur- brown curly hair, same down below, with like, oh, yeah, proper, like, horrible, yeah. top, horrible details to hear. And then yeah. when he's saying, like, again, in the clip that we just heard, like, I'm, you know, I'll send, maybe I'll send her back to you, back to you in bits. I'll send, I'll send you, I'll send you pieces of her from time to time. Oof, horrible. Yeah. Um, but the, do you, do you think that line about, uh, brown curly hair upstairs and down do you think that she was sexually assaulted by these guys mm. that's the only inc- indication of that yeah and yeah. and the fact that maybe maybe she was but uh mm. because well, what, it's not it, it's, not, it's like, not made it, well it's be, sort of it's sort of i'm not, not that not that they wouldn't I'm, I'm, I'm not i'm like i'm saying that the the absence or the apparent absence of any kind of like lurid uh sort of uh libidinal uh uh, motivation on their part, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they they seem to just be motivated by avarice and uh, you know, amorality, mm-hmm. um, rather than like being serious. They're not serial killers in that in that no. sense. You know, they're not, you know, car- carrying out some fun- like sexual fantasy, no pa- power fantasy. Uh, 
but that doesn't obviously mean that they are not like opportunistic and they're uh, certainly rapists. yeah and you certainly get the idea that they're capable of such heinous yeah acts. absolutely but um, uh, my quest my question is like that that's the only suggestion that that has taken place at all yeah yeah and, yeah. and the question the question then though and this is this is something that only occurred to me rewatching at this time is uh given and considering that the mystery is wrapped up and revealed totally 30 minutes in mm-hmm. why do we not get any scenes with his wife before the end of the film why not give us her perspective from that point forward and the answer to that is the scene where he's in the barn and he's listening and sh- she is taken out of the out of the truck out of a secret storage compartment in the truck and she's wrapped in a blanket or a like a big kind of you know sheet mm-hmm. and she's not moving and we're led for a moment to think that she's dead yeah and that's the i think that's the only reason i think it's i think they traded um whatever potential there was for exploring that side of the story for that one moment yeah i don't know that it's worth it mm. because 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 ultimately it's when at the end of the big action sequence on the bridge at the end when uh yeah, Red is eventually falls off the bridge, and he's but he's still alive. He's lying down on the rocks in the river. It's Amy who pulls the the gear stick or the handbrake and and releases the truck and kills yeah, him. And that's yeah, her yeah. act of revenge. But that would have a lot more emotional resonance if we had spent more time with Amy and maybe even seen some of those like some of that. Ab- yeah, I agree. Su- yeah, like once suggested at abuse. Yeah. Uh, seen what she did to try to free herself or yeah like, so it becomes we know, meaningful we know for, for example her, right that final sure we get because we, cause we don't get her perspective yeah. at all yeah uh which is i don't not not necessarily saying that we need to get her perspective but i'm saying that we are given that moment mm-hmm. and that moment is a little bit devoid of content because we haven't had her perspective so it's just some structural thing mm-hmm. uh we you know could have seen like for example the, there's a Whole like the whole thing at the beginning of the film where there where she's reading some competition on a pack of donuts, yeah, uh, where you can win ninety thousand uh, dollars, and she. The interesting there's an interesting thing about this film in that they, <laughs> it's it's all one big misunderstanding. They kidnap people who they know to be wealthy. They kidnap these people because they see their new car and it's an yeah. expensive new car. But it's an expensive new car that they can't can't really properly afford. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so they're actually not wealthy at all, but they have been kidnapped on the assumption that they are wealthy. And in order to not just be killed and disposed of, uh, she she she's asked by them to tell them how much money they have in their bank account, and she claims that her husband is like a donut mogul, and mm-hmm. that they have ninety thousand dollars in the account, and she hopes that they will convey to him that information and he'll be able to then give give the same figure and that's what happens so they believe then that um yeah that they have this ninety thousand dollars but it's a <laughs> it's a funny plot point as well because not like you know generally in a like if you take like something like ron howard's ransom or something like that it's a you know, it's a rich family you know yeah, the, yeah, sure. the, the child sure. of a rich family is, is kidnapped uh and that, do, that does give this kind of a unique angle because they don't have the money yeah, there's no way for him to get ninety thousand dollars. Yeah, no, I like that. I and I like how you know the the, the initial setup that like the reason he uh, isn't kidnapped at the start is because he's the one who doesn't want to leave the the car. And you, you know they got that real sort of um, he plays it so well, Russell. Um, like you know being torn between the reality of the situation, but like not wanting to leave your car at, on the side of the road. And that, by the way, I think that's my sort of favorite point in the film i mean it's not to say that it peaks as early as it does but um you know when the so as i said in synopsis when the guys confront them at the gas station the ones who have no oh, oh, no they don't do they no they're not part of the the gang that kidnapped them but at the, the gas station they are, yeah. yeah they yeah. are so they're, yeah so they're, they're the guys who they're the guys yeah, who so it's a completely battery. like manual yeah. Fa- yeah i thought yeah so it's completely like manufactured this whole scenario but we're not yeah, to know yeah. that at that point anyway so my point is um when that car stops in the distance and the windows are like kind of darkened and and it's just like the engine's on and jeff and amy are completely shitting themselves rightly rightfully mm. so because you would wouldn't you on the on one of those roads and it's just oh it's inherently menacing and pretty 
damn nasty the implications of it and then you're so yeah. relieved when uh, Walsh shows up and then <laughs> and then like yeah. yeah and then the clip where you know I keep scene story that I keep referring back to when like he recognizes him but he doesn't recognize him and it's it's played so yeah. well but uh yeah I like I like the film a lot um it's a it's a 7 out of 10 for me I just it just it meaning it, yeah meaning, what, you, meaning you, uh meaning I like really it a lot like it. yeah like it a lot yeah like it a lot okay so it's an 8 for me meaning I like it a lot okay <laughs> <laughs> We're going to smooth this out and streamline it by the next episode. I promise, honestly. Uh, yeah. So we, the only, yeah, the yeah. only thing, and it's, this is something that only struck me this time, is is that structural issue of like, I would trade that, admittedly very good moment where he mm. thinks that his wife is dead. I would trade that for some time spent with Amy, and hopefully, therefore, a greater emotional impact to her act of revenge at the end. Well, I mean, um, you could you could still have the way that you want to play it, and still have that moment where he thinks she's dead. You know, you could spend more time with Amy, and you could manu- you could script it or manufacture it in such a way that we're led to believe they might kill her. Mm, and so sure. then the next time we see her, then yeah, oh god, they really did kill her, and then yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Okay, uh, do you want to move on to the last film? Uh, yes. Okay, so our last film is Shrew's Nest. ¿Por qué no te bebes el agua bendita? Eso es lo que necesitas. Lo que necesito es ir a un hospital y no seguir drogado con morfina. ¿Cómo lo sabes? He llegado a conocerte muy bien, Monse. Porque eres igual que yo. Eres una mentirosa. Alguien incapaz de decirle la verdad a la gente que quiere. Haces igual con tu hermana. Dices que la quieres, pero mientes. La maltratas. La encierras en tu burbuja. Esa es tu forma de amar, Monse. Esa es tu forma de amar. ¡Mírame! La verdad os hará libres. Lo decía eso el hijo de tu Dios. Empieza por hacer lo mismo. Empieza por decir la verdad. Y quizás así alguien pueda quererte algún día. Okay, so final film this episode, uh, Shrew's Nest, original title Musaranias, which just translates as Shrews. Uh, released in 2014 in Spain. It wasn't released here. This is funny. I was, um, I followed this film. I had it on a, like a, you know, anticipated films list in 2014 i had it on a list in 2015 i had it on a list in 2016 and eventually i just thought it was never going to come out and it was never released on dvd or anything like that and then uh in early 2017 i realized that it had been quietly released exclusively to shutter in december of 2016 so i I didn't actually get ever get an opportunity to watch it as part of a calendar year's viewing you know right Uh, yeah so yeah it snuck out in december of 2016 uh, I'm sorry, Shudder is a Shudder is a, platform. is a horror and genre streaming service that I subscribe to. Right, um, right. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, anyway. So, um, this is uh, the directorial feature debut of uh, Juan Fernando Andres and Esteban Roel. It's produced by Alex de la Iglesia um, and written by uh, Juan Fernando Andres and Sofia Cuenca. Um as I said, released in 2014. Uh, it, the film is set in the 1950s, and the main character's name is Monse, and played by Macarena Gomez, who is uh, an agoraphobic seamstress who uh, has spent her life raising her uh, younger sister, considerably younger, right? She's quite a bit younger. Sure. Yeah, she is. She's, she's, she, yeah, she's quite a bit younger. Um, so Young enough to be a daughter. <laughs> Um, spoiler alert. Uh, okay, so they, she, she spends her days, uh, locked in her apartment. Um, she works out of that apartment. <laughs> and, uh, uh, she's sort of, um, her, her, her younger sister is sort of, uh, coming of age and starting to take an interest in boys and going out. And she's 
starting to demonstrate signs of uh, impending independence, uh, which uh, upsets Monsi um, and makes her, you know, makes her feel anxious about her own future. Uh, their their father disappeared fourteen years previously uh, during the the Civil War, um, and then one day. Uh, a strange man knocks at the door, having fallen down the stairs in the apartment. Um, and Monsi takes him in and puts him in bed and uh, uh, splints his, his broken leg. Um, and it sort of develops from there. Will we leave it there? Despite yeah. you just having spoiled the twist. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't resist. Um, is there a reason why it's set in 1950s? Uh, what we surmise to, to be Madrid. I think it might be even it might even say in the film that it's Madrid. But is there a reason why it's a period production? It is. It is. It is Madrid. Yeah. yeah. Is there a reason why it's a period? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I guess mean, for, like, you know, it's, way, it's a directorial the... debut, and you know, it, it obviously it's like a it's it's set in and around this apartment. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, it never really leaves it. We see the hallway once, and we, we see, see the we see the hallway. We see the and we yeah. see the street from the apartment. And we see um, the upstairs apartment at one point as well. Yeah. Or at a couple sure. of points. But yeah, we never actually, the camera never actually leaves the building. Yeah. But, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, my point is that it, this, this story could be set. I'm, I'm, was I missing something that has allegorical reference? Why is it set in 1950s Spain? Is it um, just well, so I, that the father kind of disappeared in the Civil War? Uh well, certainly there's that, yeah. Uh, there's also the the centrality of uh, Catholicism sure. the, and, the, and the the dominance of, of uh, like the church in Spain, which, you know, obviously if you said it today it wouldn't be as sure. uh, severe. But, yeah. yeah, beyond that, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I didn't mean to imply a criticism when I asked it, despite yeah. the tone. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you hadn't seen this film, as you said. I wasn't. I wasn't even aware that it existed uh, before you mentioned it for this episode. Um, so went into it completely blind, um, like a baby shrew. Absolutely. Reading around it after watching it confirmed what I was thinking during it, which is that it's very sort of reminiscent. Um, well, not very reminiscent, just in terms of very like. I suppose a, a a predominant strand of its plot recalls misery. Sure. Yeah. Um, but it's from the other perspective. Yeah. Sure. Right. It's not from the perspective of the the hobbled prisoner. It's from the perspective of his uh, his uh, captor. Yeah. Um, Monsi, which um, obviously shifts the the tone of the film. Mm. Uh, would you? Like okay, so the the reason that I followed this through, you know, three years, impatiently waiting for it to, you know, <laughs> despite despite the fact that it was available yeah. online and so One on, I, I was I was waiting yeah. for it to be officially kind of released so I could you know officially yeah. watch it, uh, is because of the involvement of Alex de la Iglesia, who, mm. uh, you know, is a pretty well known uh, Spanish genre filmmaker. Mm-hmm. By whom I've seen two films: uh, The Day mm-hmm. of the Beast from 1995 and La Comunidad, also known as Commonwealth from 2000, mm-hmm. which are both excellent. I really, really, really like them both, particularly La Comunidad. Um, and uh, this one sounded up my alley. It sounded like the kind of thing that I would enjoy. Yeah, uh, and I did. I did enjoy it, but it wasn't what I was expecting. Uh, mm. It wasn't. It's 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 one of those films for me that it never. There, there are kind of like a number of possible things that it could be, depending on the way in which it would shift its emphasis, and instead it kind of shoots straight down the middle and doesn't really ever become any of those. They're kind of I kind of see these three different potential shrews nests, and it instead it kind of not to say that it misses the mark. Uh, I would have preferred that it leaned sort of wholeheartedly into one of those three potential films rather than trying to kind of give them all equal play. And Do you like think to that's me, the, a commercial decision on their part or a, a, no, an aesthetic choice think, informed by commercial 
considerations. No, I mean, because I, I think they could certainly have made a much more commercially... I mean, the movie was barely released, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. They certainly could have... There's certainly a, a version of this story that's a lot more commercial, uh, and that's one of the three... In fact, even... Like I said, like, I'll stop being cagey. <laughs> the three versions of the film that I see here are uh, something a lot more uh, macabre, because let's reveal the twist. Do you want to reveal the twist, since you've already... So the the twist is that um, rather than um, Nia and Monse's uh, mother dying at birth and Monse being burdened to bring her up, um, Monse's mother died, um, and in the aftermath of of that, um, her father Padre, played by Luis Tuzo, um, uh, turned kind of a bit nasty, let's say, and uh, began to abuse and assault her repeatedly um, and raped her, um, mm. a consequence of which is that she became pregnant with Nia. Mm -hmm. So she is the mother of her own uh, sister, um, as is revealed at the, at the very end of the film. Although, did you did you guess that before the end? I I'm, Yeah, I did. Yeah, so Although, you know, halfway I, through. Yeah, I never, I never really hold a film's twist against it because I'm, I'm usually very, very bad at foreseeing films uh, twists that are foreshadowed and everything else. So you know, I, I didn't really mind that I saw it coming. I don't know no, how you I, feel with general I don't, twists. Like I don't, that. I'm not, I'm not good at guessing them either. I don't really, I don't really second guess plots the way that a lot yeah, of people do. No, do I, I don't really like, try to, I try to anticipate what's coming. Yeah. Um, but I thought I did think it was very. Oh, sorry, we should say that the father uh, doesn't appear. In the film, in the he he doesn't you know he's dead so in anything uh, other than flashbacks yeah no they're not flashbacks they're, well, they're like yeah like only 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 yeah only Monse sees him it's like he's a ghost but he's not a ghost yeah he she she kind of yeah he she, like taunts a, he's, her he's a projection and, of her imagination and he ta yeah he taunts her and puts her down and yeah. but he also at one point about halfway through alludes to uh, to um, Nia. And refers to her as the girl, and on the subtitles, the girl is in inverted commas. That's it. Uh, yeah, she's never. And at that point, I was like, "Oh, okay." Uh, Nia is Monse's daughter, and and the, uh, and then I I concluded from that that Monse must have killed her father, which is what right. happened. Uh, I mean, like, and the body, and the body is concealed. To, uh, is Nia, and even yeah, yeah, Carlos, yeah. the 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 captor. Uh, that's that's the captive. Sorry, um, he says at one point, you know, I I never asked your name, and he never he's never told. It. Sorry, I interrupted there. Right, that's true. Yeah, no, sorry. So one of the one of the three versions of of Shrew's Nest that I can kind of imagine mm -hmm. uh, is is one that that again leans more heavily into that aspect of it, and and is more macabre and more uh, darker and more kind of disturbing. Uh, right, like the, the <laughs> you know, it's funny actually um, when. Uh, things have escalated, and uh, Monse has ended up killing, you know, the the fiance of her of her captive mm -hmm. who's come to come to you know investigate and rescue him, uh, and her father's specter or whatever is taunting her and telling her that they're like, where are you going to hide the bodies? You know, there's not much room left around here. <laughs> but then when Nia when Nia finally discovers the the is it like a sealed up fireplace or something like that behind yeah. like a, a cabinet or a piano or something. Yeah. Uh, and pulls away the boards and goes in there. There's loads of room in there. <laughs> room for like ten more bodies. Yeah. She has no reason to worry. Yeah. Uh, but his, the father's skeleton is in there, and like that kind of thing with like bodies hidden in the walls and like skeletons and like that kind of macabre, kind of gothic kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, you know that and like the the buried family secrets and all that kind of like almost like Vincent Price kind of Edgar Allan Poe yeah. sort of thing. That that could have been one version of it, and another one would have been. Uh, much more splatter heavy, because yeah. about I think I, I wrote down that it was fifty seven minutes in when the bloodletting begins, mm -hmm. and I expected it to happen much earlier. But once it ha once it started to happen, I was like, okay, here we go. Mm. You know, it's going to be a bloodbath, and it's not really. You know, well, there's one like, there's uh... one scene where there's one scene where uh, her captive is you know dragging himself around the house. This is where the her, his fiance or girlfriend or whatever is has been murdered and uh, Monse is 
sawing the body, sawing off the legs. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's blood everywhere, and he's crawling through the blood, and he's ga- dragging, dragging his now gangrenous leg behind him. <sighs> can I just um, say? Can I just say that? So you've got two horrific situations happening at the same time. There, you got as you just mentioned, Monse cutting up the corpse of his mm. fiance. As horrible as that is, you know, by visual suggestion, whatever else, the slow burn pain of his dislocated knee or whatever it is, like, <laughs> oh, dragging that along, it's excruciating. Oh, God. When, I mean, he, that, when, that he, when he has to... Send shivers down when, my spine much more than anything when else he, in the he, film. When he lifts the leg, he oh, lifts the gangrenous God. leg off the bed and drops it onto the onto the pillow. Yeah. <laughs> Oof. Vomitous. Um, yes. So there's that scene, and then there's the scene where you know she has to hide, she has to hide the body, so she cuts off her head, like hides the head under under like a platter cover, like yeah. on the table or something like that, and puts the the torso inside one of her, uh, like turns into one of her not not mannequins. What do you call those things that that dressmakers yeah, yeah, use? Like the, a, yeah, yeah, I know what whatever, you mean, though. That thing. Yeah. Uh, one of them. <laughs> so you know, it's like her her severed ne- neck is is showing through the, the top of the dress. Um, but it doesn't fully lean into that either. Yeah, um, I agree. I agree. It's weird. It's yeah. um, so it, it be, it's final twists and everything else as they come across as preposterous to me, and they're emotionally neat complications, like the whole incest angle, because it's never quite thematized in the film. So, like you mentioned, like the you know the bodies in the in the walls or whatever else. That doesn't ne- that never quite informs the aesthetic of the film. So it's like a very sort of slickly done film that mm. sustains itself as a thriller, but never quite enters sort of horror territory for me. But right, you're the horror yeah. buff, so maybe maybe you disagree. With I that. would I would say I I would say it's kind of psychological horror, but that's kind of the third version of the film that it yeah. doesn't fully become either. That it doesn't fully transform into psychological horror. That that it that it threatens to because you know when you think about. Mm. Uh, you think about a film like Misery, which is very much told from the perspective of the of the James Caan character. Mm. Uh, if you were to switch the perspectives and tell it from the perspective of the Kathy Bates character, mm. um, you know it would be you, you would imagine like you you would want to get inside her head in a particular way. Yeah, and I mean you do get you do get quite a bit of that in this, but it doesn't feel like it again fully commits to that. Yeah, maybe it's maybe it's the way that it it wants to hold its cards close to its chest and hold them back for this final reveal. Which kind of precludes exploring them before that? Uh, yeah, um, so it kind of undoes itself in a way. It's, it seems to me counterintuitive. Like it has, it seems it's, it's a it's it's a funny thing to say, but it seems to have storytelling and thrills rather than themes and images. Mm-hmm. Like you know, the, the the there's an information overload as well within the first ten minutes, which I found extremely disorienting on a sort of literary plot level. Um, for such a for, for for a film with such a simple plot, um, and and sort of small canvas to work with, um, and like the mm, the Catholicism, like just seems to be like a, a causal moral device rather than anything that's explored in any sort of meaningful or or lasting way for me. It it just seems, you know, I completely. I completely agree with what you're saying. It, it it seems to be sort of consciously not torn between registers, but kind of trying to, and it's a very ambitious film in some ways because of this, but it's trying to sort of have its hands in sort of too many pies. Yeah. 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 That's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. They're, they're like it's, uh, I mean the, the religious stuff is there. I mean, there's the, you know the um, and again, this is probably informs the decision to have it, you know, set in a particular period. But yeah. you know that Nia is not religious, but yeah, that Monse sure. is, and that Nia has, you know, uh, this huge crucifix in her her bedroom yeah. that she doesn't like, and she takes it off the wall and hides it under the bed. And Monse says, you know, that it really upsets me that you do that. Uh, and she says, I don't like it. Uh, it's it's eyes follow you around the room. It's all like it's always watching you. Yeah. She says, but that's that's the way it is. Like, like you know, God is always watching you. Um, yeah. I mean, like, in a way, the film is very rich in that kind of way. It has a lot of... Uh, yeah, but I feel know. like it's, it's, it's rich because it's written, like, it's... 
it's uh, I don't know, like it, it doesn't feel like it sort of dramatizes in any way. Like its richness was there before they began to make the film, and then all they needed to do was just sort of like shoot it, if you know what I mean. Like it's a rich concept, but like I don't really feel like mm. the 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 imagery sort of there in the film. I don't know, and maybe maybe it's the maybe I wasn't in the mood to watch something that's so kind of restricted to a single setting. I don't know. I just felt like, so like, let's, let's come back a bit. So many, many episodes now we watched Lanteria, the French uh, yeah. horror film, which is also a debut film by two directors. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that is a similar kind of setup. Um, perhaps not in terms of plot, but the way in which it develops into a belated bloodbath which is a very controlled film before it becomes one um, in a domestic setting. And that does feel like a film or did feel like a film that follows through with its the things that it teases at. And it does put its eggs in one basket rather than trying to distribute them uh, over, sure. over several. And this film, I mean, you know, what we're saying basically here is that I think the film succeeds at what it wants to be, but it wasn't quite what we wanted it to be. I'd say kind of that it it shoots it aims high, mm. uh, that just it's I mean it, it that kind of qualified compliment of saying that its reach exceeds its grasp, you know it's it's trying to do a lot of different things at the same time, yeah, uh, and all of the things that it's trying to do appeal to me, uh, in themselves, but yeah. in ninety minutes it's a little much and everything ends up feeling a little bit underserved. That said, I like the film. Yeah, uh, I definitely enjoyed it, but it never rose above that to me. It never uh, reached its potential, and it's a little frustrating sometimes. Like when you when you watch a film and you when you watch a film maybe in a genre that isn't your your bread and butter, you know. Yeah. yeah. Like if I watch like if I watch say for example I watch like a really critically acclaimed romantic comedy or something like that. Sure. And I and I like it, but I don't I don't love it. It doesn't you know become a favorite of mine or whatever. I'm kind of happy with that, you know, but a mm. film like this, I couldn't help but be disappointed that I liked it and didn't love it, you know, because not only, sure. not only does it, does it on the surface sound very much like my kind of thing, uh, in numerous ways. Um, but it, it was also something that I had been kind of, you know, technically looking forward to for like three years. Yeah. Uh, and I the reason the that I chose yeah. it for this episode is to give myself, like to, to say, I would just, you know, kind of get around, to, like sick of seeing Shrew's Nest on my to watch list, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, can yeah. You think but I would definitely, I would definitely be interested in the, in these filmmakers and what they continue to do. And I hope they continue to work in, in, uh, in horror. Have you seen any other like films that have prompted the same emotional critical response in you within the same kind of genre? disappointed by a film despite thinking that it was good yeah and like within the I film think... like in in during the film itself it teases it like you know things that could potentially have been great yeah i think a good a good comparison in, in that respect would be uh the world's end by edgar wright oh right yeah the third the third in the in the cornetto trilogy yeah where like hot fuzz is one of my favorite comedies of all time right um and the, I remember, I remember watching the world's end and being so excited for it mm. and thinking kind of halfway through thinking, this is definitely a good film, mm. but I'm, I can't help but be disappointed that it's not amazing. Um, and I, I wish that they were taking it in this direction more so than this direction and, and kind of, but it's just like the weight of expectations and, you know, in, in a way it's not fair at all, but it's kind of sure. unavoidable. I read somewhere recently, just to get off the topic somewhat. That Edgar Wright, and I don't know how much I agree with this, but Edgar Wright's films tend to, by the end, by the the end of their running time, seem to be reproducing or reinforcing the very narratives they're meant to be sort of subverting, or you know, merely, you know, I don't know. Anyway, coming back, <laughs> coming back, coming back to, uh, coming <laughs> we'll back do an Edgar Wright film, and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll refer back to this. Coming back to this film, uh, it's funny that. Uh, you know, I was reading some some of the translated responses to it from Spanish critics at the time of its uh, premiere, and many of them seemed to go in for uh, or going against Hugo Silva's performance as Carlos, the captive, 
Um, even Jonathan Holland of the Hollywood Reporter, this is this is even just from the Wikipedia page, uh, said um, it was a literally and metaphorically flat performance. <laughs> um, but like even Spanish critics, like, and I, I, you know, I don't know anything of Hugo Silva's work. But uh, I, I, you know, when I was watching it, I wasn't thinking like, oh, yeah, he's the obvious weak link. I mean, he's just like a, you know, a handsome guy who's been cast in a role that has very little to do, I guess. One thing that I think could have been improved um, in addition to the things that you've touched upon is like the connection between Carlos and Nia. Like, because they're mm. meant to be sort of, because it's like this romantic three-way entanglement, right? Where Monse yeah. kind of falls in love with Carlos uh, Carlos falls for Nia and Nia for him, and you know, uh, again, that that requires time to develop a thriller around just that. Um, but yeah. it hasn't really given it, yeah. Because part part of what's established is that Nia is afraid of Monsi. Yeah, uh, she she believes her to be her domineering and kind of unhinged older sister, mm-hmm. uh, and she communicates that to Carlos. And there's a couple, there are a couple of scenes where Nia has snuck into Carlos's room, uh, initially kind of out of curiosity and then kind of to help him out. And then eventually they've developed this, uh, affection. Um, and she's like deliberately wearing, you know, particular dresses when she goes in there and, mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. Uh, but she has to keep that secret from Monse. And there are a couple of scenes where Monse almost discovers Nia in the room. And there, there is this tension where like what would happen if she, if she did discover what was going on between mm-hmm. them, mm-hmm. but that's that that it also is not really allowed to uh, develop to a, to a climax because the revelation of incest and their actual you know biological relationship mm-hmm. undermines it or under, not undermines it but but it, it sort of uh, negates it you know like yeah. the, what, what's what's building the tension and the kind of the the sense of peril that's building around Nia is it kind of evaporates with that revelation. Yeah. Uh, because we know, we know that like our, I, I certainly felt at that point that I, I felt that Nia felt that Monse wouldn't hurt her anymore. Yeah. You know? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I should say that, um, Macarena Gomez who plays Monse is really, really, really good. I was just going to ask it's that. A great, yeah, it's a great performance. Gonna, yeah. Um, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Do you think that this is a very typical directorial debut in that sense, what we're seeing? Yeah, I was going to say that. that uh, like you asked if it was potentially a commercial consideration. Yeah. I actually think it's probably the opposite. It's probably, mm-hmm. oh my God, we have, we, oh my God, we get to make a film. Uh, you know. Yeah, let's make like, three. Let's take <laughs> all of these ideas yeah. and put them in the same film because we might not ever get a chance to make another mm-hmm. one. Yeah. Uh, it happens it so many hard. times, though. It happens so many times that on yeah. on a small scale, uh, you know, small budgeted film. Yeah. Um. Okay. Well, what would you give this out of ten? Um. So I gave it six, which means, which means I you like liked it. it. Yeah, but if I, I, I gave it a seven, which means I liked it. Go. Is this like the first episode where we've completely agreed then on? <laughs> But, but we? it should be actually so, like, by the time of, you know, when, on, our, on our next episode, um, I'll have added your your other grade. So I liked it with reservations. Mm. So for me, it's a six still. <laughs> this is a really, really bad explanation of what it's going to become. No, it's a six, which currently means I liked it. But next but it, week next you will like it with reservations. Yeah, but next week it means <laughs> like the run of reservations. Yeah, yeah. But but does that mean the next week Shrew's Nest is a seven? Uh, no. Next week it remains a six. That's what I mean. So like, because I yeah. Why why do you, why does it go down? Because I don't I don't currently have a rating that means like it with reservations. If you see what I mean. Okay. So I need to yeah, like okay. yeah, open that space up, but then keep uh-huh. keep. Keep the film in there. Fucking hell, it's late, man. Should we? Can we just end the episode? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's let's wrap it up then. 
All right, thanks for listening to The Habitus. Please follow us on Twitter at Habitus Pod and on Stitcher on TuneIn, SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes, and all the rest of it. Uh, my name's Michael Patterson. I've been with the one and only Bobby Lowe. And uh, tune in again and uh, share, subscribe, like, uh, and comment. And we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. Cheers. Thank you.